I extend you the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning on the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Today's text is a little change up this morning. We're going to talk about the epistle, not the gospel, which is Romans 13 today. So please join me in prayer. Father, we ask the Lord for your blessings. Uh, we look at this most difficult text as we face situations in our life that this text speaks to. Open our hearts, our ears, and our minds to hear what you have to say to us this day concerning how Paul's letter to the Romans, especially chapter 13, applies to our situation. How, Lord, being in tune with you, maybe we can be instruments of peace and reconciliation in this nation that is torn. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. My friends in Christ, if people were to ask me what type of preacher I am, the first response would be, I'm a lectionary preacher. Lectionary are the readings that the church assigns Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It's not church readings that I assign or a few other people assign. It's the church at large that assigns readings to be read on these specific Sundays. One of the things I like about preaching on the lectionary is this, that if the church has assigned these readings, it means those who are lectionary churches, like ours and others, you can find them not just in Lutherans, but in Catholics and Orthodox and Reformed Presbyterians, they're going to be using the same readings. It's kind of neat for me to recognize that even though among our division in the church, we still at least have this unity in the scriptures of agreeing to use the same readings among us all to say we speak with one voice. That's why lectionary preaching for me is invaluable. Second reason why lectionary preaching for me is invaluable, that it always speaks to the time of the church year. You know, like for the season of Advent, we're going to be talking about readings that deal with repentance, preparation, you're going to hear a lot of John the Baptist in the Advent season. You're going to hear about the Annunciation. Angel Gabriel tells Jesus, Mary that she's going to carry the Christ child. That sure means work according to the church season. Today we are in the season of growth. The altar area should be green, but it's red today because we're having confirmation. And green for the altar is a symbol of growing in the knowledge of Christ. So during this season of Sundays after Pentecost, the messages are to help us, especially in the gospel, grow in the knowledge of who Jesus is, what he has done, and how he makes himself real in our life, and the life of the church. Over the course of years, when I was a vicar at Florida, Pastor Gherkin was my supervisor teaching, my instructor. He would always preach on the gospel. I was only there for one year, but I kind of thought that was really good, preaching on the gospel. And churches like ours will use a three-year lectionary, which means that for one year, most of the gospel readings will come from Matthew, and then when we start a new church here in Advent, now they'll better come from Mark. And then another new year, we're going to have the readings predominantly from Luke. So you can safely say that a pastor can stay in a church for three years and preach on a different gospel lesson every Sunday. Except what do you do when you're in a church for 31? Like I was at Faith and Demont. I didn't want to really be repetitive. I thought... I need to be yet creative. And so I relegated myself to the Old Testament ritual of casting lots, which means Monday morning I'm coming to my office, say a little prayer, and roll the dice. If it came up one, I'm preaching on the Old Testament. If it came up two, I'm preaching on the Epistle. If it came up three, I'm preaching on the Gospel. If it came up four, I would be preaching on the intro of the song of the day. Five or six, well, those were rollovers with another prayer. 
You see, I've only been here two, so I've got another year of preaching on the gospel before I have to go back to the casting of lots. So I'm thinking Monday morning I'm going to come in, I'm going to look at the gospel, but the lecturer spoke really loud to me Monday morning as I started with prayer. And I was like Romans 13 just screaming at me. You must preach on this this Sunday. You must break from your pattern. The people of God need to hear about Romans 13 today in this country. So I changed it up this morning. Instead of using the gospel, hearing God's voice speak to me Monday, we're looking at Romans 13. And what do we see there in Romans 13? St. Paul tells us a lot about the Christian's relationship with the government. He tells us a couple of things. First of all, that the government is ordained by God. That means God has instituted it. God has brought it into our world. Second of all, St. Paul says there is no institution that is not ordained by God. I'll give that one some thought. If the government is in control or in power, it is there because by the hand of God. Unfortunately, the government is in the hands of sinful men and the abuse of power that God gives them many times. Yet Paul says, stay obedient to the government as Christians, regardless of how oppressive that government may be. Difficult thing for us as Christians because in our country specifically, we, we love that declaration of independence. We love our freedom. And we hate to see government take away human rights or the rights of its citizens. This is the unfortunate thing in the fallen world. You're not going to find the perfect government. Never will. There was a time when there was perfect government. It was in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve and God. No arguments, no disagreements. Hard to believe that before sin, Adam and Eve never had a fight. Sin came into the world and disrupted utopia. Throughout the perfect government. Because when sin came into the world, God had two choices. Either he could stay in human life with sin, which means, therefore, that sin would be destroyed and human life with it. Or he could pull back until he could formulate a plan and enact a plan in which sinful man would be able to dwell with him again. God opts for option B. He pulls back. That's why when we look in our life today and deal with loss and deal with grief, when we ask the question, where is God? He has pulled back. There's no question about it. He's not with us as he was with Adam and Eve before sin because he can't without destroying us. So he pulls back. As he pulls back, he institutes these governments to rule us indirectly. And so, as St. Paul says, the government that which you are under, Rome was not a good government for the Christians. I'm sure you know that history. They martyred many Christians. They taxed them heavily. And Paul says, be obedient. You would almost have to say when you look at the time of Paul and the time of wars, the government's probably in a much worse situation for the Christians than today. And yet this council of Paul stands before us. Sin has caused God to pull back, rule us indirectly through sinful institutions like government. At the same time, too, now sin even causes man to reject the government that God has instituted. I, I look back at the time of Samuel, last judge of Israel. There was a verse in the scripture where God was ruling the people just fine through Moses and Joshua and the judges. But the people weren't happy with that system anymore. They wanted a king. Samuel said to them, you're a bunch of idiots because you don't know what a king's going to do for you. 
regardless of Samuel's attempt to try and persuade them from going into the government style of the rest of the pagan nations, God relents. God says, The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Sin has caused a mess. It has caused sinful institutions to rule over us. It has caused people sometimes wrongfully to rebel against government. It has caused mass confusion and chaos in our world of what we as Christians are called to do in our situations. It is not an easy world in which we live. Not because of God, because of us. We made this mess. In spite of all this, Paul says, stay obedient to the government because God will work through the government, even unjust governments. We may only rebel against government, St. Paul says, it's all the scripture, if the government tells us to do something against the counsel of God, Acts 5.29. We must obey God rather than men. But remember this verse in context. Peter said this after he was told by the government that he should not preach Christ crucified. That was definitely a law not in with the counsel and will of God. And Peter and the rest of the apostles felt confident that they were not violating God's will when they violated the command not to preach Christ crucified to the world. We must obey God rather than men. And so, in our world today, it calls for discernment. Whether the government's asking us to do something against God's laws. And sometimes that's not an easy question to answer. We all have struggle with that. Sometimes it's clear as night and day, and then sometimes it's not so clear. But St. Paul wishes to remind us that even in the midst of confusion and chaos, and even in injustice, God can work through the government. And not just government. Pause and think. Did God do something tremendous or an unjust government 2,000 years ago? Was there someone in this world that was deprived of justice? Was there someone that was sent to death when his judge knew he was innocent? Who am I thinking of? Jesus Christ. An unjust government, God works through to bring salvation. You know, in the conversation Pilate has with Jesus there, he gets really upset with Christ because Christ is just being so quiet and he's not seeking to defend himself. Pilate was looking for something from Jesus that could give him grounds to let him go. And so Jesus is asked by Pilate these questions. Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and the power to release you? And then Jesus says this. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Jesus submitted himself to Pilate and to unjust government because he was submitting himself to his father's will to save the world. Think about that. Jesus allowed injustice to be done to him so that justice for you against sin could be accomplished. Isn't that powerful? God allows injustice to his own son so he can justly forgive your sins. That is the power and love and majesty of God at work. When we look at the situation between our relationship between us and the government, which Paul shares with us in Romans 13, we are reminded of these things, that God can work great things even through unjust governments, such as our salvation, and sometimes, unfortunately, our discipline. 
Discipline that's needed because of rebellion. The Jews are the people of God, right? They had everything going really well for them for many years. And they would constantly be going against God, sin against Him, worship idols, commit acts of idolatry, and violate His commandments. And no matter how many prophets God would send to them, they would not change. So what do parents do sometimes when reason doesn't work with a child? They put him into time out. So God puts his people in the time out. For 70 years he puts them in the time out. And he sends them to this country of Babylon. And in Jeremiah 29, God writes a letter to the exiles of the prophet Jeremiah. And he tells them this about the government in which now they are under. Notice this. Notice what he says. Seek the peace, or really the Hebrew word is the welfare of the city. Not the destruction. Seek the welfare of the city of Babylon, where I've caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its welfare or peace, you shall have peace. Hmm. What a challenge to pray for a government that's not true. That's what God and Christ encourage us to do so. I can't tell you how many times over my lifetime, 61 years, and in the ministry of 31, we've seen changes of presidents and administrations. That every time a change of administrations has happened in an election year, one or two people will come in my office and tell me, I'm really concerned about this person leading our country. Or others will say, I can't even pray for this guy. And I'm like, wait a minute, Jeremiah 29 7. Pray for these people. They probably need your prayers more than ever when you disagree with them. And you think they're leading the nation down the road. Pray for these people. And second of all, remember that regardless who's in control in the government, the ultimate control lies with God. If you want to talk about chaos, let's look at that Good Friday. People are yelling and screaming. Some asking for the crucifixion of Christ. Some crying that he needs to be let go. Pilate is losing control to the point where he follows popular opinion. And Matthew says that when he saw a riot was beginning, that's when he turns Jesus over to injustice. And he says, I'm washing my hands of this man. Was God out of control on that Good Friday, or was he in control? Christian believers would say he's very much in control. He was guiding that day to getting Jesus to the cross for the salvation of the world. Regardless of who's in charge, pray for the welfare. And remember, God is still in control. And over the course of time, then we as Christians are called to just wait upon the Lord and look for discernment of when a change of government to be taking place by His hand, not by ours. How many years were the people of Israel in slavery in Egypt? Anybody know how many years that was? 400 years until He finally sent Moses. Then in the book of Judges, it goes through a complete cycle. I mean, you hear a number of judges going up and down, up and down. It was because of the rebellion of the people of God and his son. And so the book of Judges is one of those books where the people rebel, God puts them in subjection to a foreign government, then God appointed a leader, a judge, to let them free. Then they, out of freedom, rebel against God, and then God puts them into imprisonment again, under another, then another judge. It goes on and on. For example, the one I want to talk about today is, is Gideon. <clears throat> because the people rebelled against God God put his people under the authority of the Midianites for seven years the Midianites were basically the boys if you read Judges chapter 6 the people of Israel would sow their crops and when harvest was to come the Midianites would come and take away all their crops like the big bully taking away milk money 
God sent prophets saying, hey, wait on this, wait for me, wait, wait, for, wait on it, wait on it, it's going to happen. Finally then, he appoints one of his own people, Gideon, to lead a rebellion against the power of the Midianites. So sometimes, God will raise one up within his people to change the government, if need be, by his hand. For it is through the hand of God that changes take place. Job chapter 12, verse 23, tells us this very truth. He makes the nations great and then destroys them. He enlarges the nations and leads them away. So for a moment, he gave many knights power, and then he takes it away through the hand of one of his own people called Gideon. Gideon gives his people for you but he was anointed by God to do so. When the people were in Babylon for 70 years, God anointed a deliverer again, but not within his own people. This time he anointed a deliverer by the name of this guy, Cyrus. He means in person. And Isaiah 45 has interesting things to say about this man called Cyrus. People of Israel were under the captivity of Babylon. And Isaiah 45, before Cyrus comes into the picture, the Lord prophesies this. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze, cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness. And why will he do this for Cyrus, who's not even a member of the Jewish family, a descendant of Abraham? He does it for this reason, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, my Israel, my chosen one. I have called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not even known it. This is the challenge. As we as Christians wait under governments, whether it be in our country or any other country, to discern how long we need to wait upon the Lord, and that not only discern how long, but through whom will God appoint a Gideon? Will God appoint a Cyrus? In the meantime, we wait and ask for spiritual discernment from the hand and the Spirit of God what He would have us do. Reminding this of ourselves, that regardless of what takes in place, God is in ultimate control. Ultimate control. And there will one day come a time in which God will dwell with His people once again because of the cross. And He will dwell with His people once again through the cross in a way which we will no longer need an institution called the government. Instead, we're going to have Christ the King. Rule us directly in heaven. Utopia, perfect government, perfect world. Once more, restored. The lectionary, God's word, hopefully has spoken to you as it spoke to me on Monday morning. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.